we did a recording with Minds Behind Maps with Maxine and Cusa and Bonnie and myself on using the Google Earth Engine, QGIS and Planetary Computer for the same analysis. And it left me a little bit not happiest that I didn't actually live code how to calculate the how to use the planet computer for the application of calculating the floodings in last year in 2022 in Pakistan. So I decided to record this slow actual running of the entire thing. So what I said then is that usually when uh, when I have to do anything with the planet computer, I start with explore. And then in this case, it was Pakistan. And I take the time to go to RTC. And I can see, you need to zoom in a little bit so the T Tyler, the rendering works through. If you really need slow, smaller, there's a little trick, which is go to where you should not see it and then click minus. So to get the, the, the to get, the size, I don't know what it is now. Um, that was in Google Chrome. I think there is a zoom out, yeah. If you zoom out enough, you get, zoom out, you get a smaller text, but bigger win, win, bigger map. So that is a little trick to, if you really need uh, bigger. But as I was saying, the flooding was, 2022 in August, so I click the selector and then I start to see. Let's wait for the results. Yeah, you can see here there's some already some of that flooding. So, and it was the 23rd, 23rd, so it's good. You can click on this button and you can see the individual scenes. This is the individual scene or where you were before. Um, for example, this one seems to have some of that, so you can see here, you get an idea. You can also, um, this is the all rendering, you can click on the images and take a look to everything, but basically that's usually what you want to do. You can zoom in to see the rice fields, it's pretty obvious here, as I was saying, in Let's pin this. As I was saying, if you use the normal RGB in Landsat or in Sentinel, let's use Sentinel for the same time. So August 22, August 20. This is cloudy. Okay, so we need to select another filter which is under 50 percent so because it's gonna use earlier and earlier i'm gonna just pick this one okay so you see that it's really cloudy and yeah i'm pretty sure yeah this is this is flooded but it's much harder to distinguish this is from the 29th it's much harder to distinguish than in synthetic aperture radar you see the village here and the village that you can even zoom in a little bit more sentinel has pretty good resolution but if you want to be sure you can take the same images sentinel 2 from let's say uh, august 21 low cloud this is a composite you can use this rendering to see yeah indeed oh i forgot to pin so this is the one from last year, I'm gonna pin it. And now I take Sentinel-2 and I go to the same thing I did, 2022, August. And I think it was here when I was showing the, yeah, there you go. So yeah, it's flooded, right? You can see that there's obviously, you can see water here, but it's way more apparent on radar actually it was there <laughs> i can i can remove this one so let's let's use this one which is the one on top to put the synthetic aperture radar from 2021 the year before 
so you can see how radar looks so this is how radar looks in a normal year and this is how it looks at the year after right actually this is it's too good something's going on there oh yeah well that's it so that's what i did to see that yeah sar is potentially good farther I realized that BVVH is a false color composite. If I only look at VH, the difference between, um, sorry, let's put 2022, 2022, there you go. The, this, is, this is the false composite, yep. So the difference between VH is kind of clear but VV is really clear to see where it's flooded in VV. And that's why I'm gonna use VV, which is vertical emission, vertical polarization of emitted radar and vertical polarization of detected radar. That's basically a specular reflection and this is more scattering, okay? So you can take the code that you click here. This is the code to get that SAR data for SAR data, Sentinel-1 RTC, for the time I chose for the region on the map. So if you just copy paste this in Python, whatever you want, then you get that. Um, so let's do it. And the way I do it, I can do, as I was explaining, you have to request access for the compute part. Since I already have access, it's basically to click there and then send an email and you should get the answer quickly. This is the hub. And in the hub, which is the compute environment, you can spin just a Pangeo notebook with CPU or the R kernel with a GPU in PyTorch, GPU and TensorFlow installed or QES. I don't need the GPUs, so I'm gonna put CPU and I run it. You could run it anywhere else. You could run actually on the code. I have an, in, on the documentation. If you go to the documentation, you can have instructions here to deploy your own half entirely, the whole thing, like with permissions, with users, with the whole thing. Um, but you can also just deploy the, the dask on the backend. And this is what I explained uh, what I saw here, which is if you just want to deploy a Dask environment, this is basically you. I create an Azure uh, resource group in West Europe, then I create this is all from the documentation of Dask Cloud Provider. If you just Google Dask Cloud Provider, it tells you how to deploy. And let's go to the documentation. There you go. This is how you do that. And it explains here what I did. So for Azure, it says it, this is exactly the code that I used. Okay, so the hub should come up soon. Sometimes takes 10 seconds, sometimes takes 30, but it's fine. Just wait a little bit. Um, I put the code on GitHub, so that link should be available. I'll put it on the description of this video. So you can also have it actually secret. It shouldn't be secret. Let me make it public. Make public. Um, how is this thing going? Okay, so successful assign. So this is the thing with the planetary computer. You're using the environment for everyone else, and that's why it take, can take more time to deploy or not. Depends on how many people are already using the planetary computer. If you don't want to wait, again, you can use locally. Like for example, here, a lot of the things you can do, you just use um, local environment. So this is my Python environment, normal Python environment. And the code, the only thing I'm gonna run, this is the explaining of the synthetic aperture. It's very visible when it's flooded versus RGB. And this is VH, which is the surface and volumetric 
uh, scattering and this is VV which is bouncing and when it's flooded it doesn't bounce back so that's why it's dark. This is the code that comes when you click that, you've seen that so we don't need to do this and this is the compute that I'm doing I could wait for this longer and it's just taking a little bit of time this was a time successfully assigned, attached, failed to attach, so probably is doing something on the background, we'll just wait a little bit more time out waiting for the condition, if it doesn't work I'll try it again but in the meantime you can just work normally, this is just Python this is the block of code to deploy the task. I could do this right now but let's just go with the normal case because it's probably what most, this is what you see, this is where I um, what I did it last time and the only thing is that when you do this you need to remember to delete it when you finish otherwise you're going to be paying for this computation this is extremely cheap because it uses the overviews and all that stuff I believe, I, I didn't check but I think running this whole thing could be like cents if you deploy your own DAS cluster this is how you do it with the cloud provider and you can use spot workers which is even greater you can wait for the workers, blah, blah, blah. This is the thing that you don't need to do. None of these you need to do if you use the Planet Computer, normal Planet Computer. Okay, so um, I needed a dusk. So I think I, I'll do it afterwards. Okay, you have a, let's start. What I need to do if I don't use the Planet Computer is to set up the subscription key if you use the PC Hub, there you go, you don't need to do any of this, you can just start, you need to forget about that cluster, you do forget about all the subscription keys because it's all set up for you, but if you don't, if you use, like I'm doing here, a remote environment, you need to connect to that kernel, the way to connect to that kernel is click on existing, the PC, and then basically you copy paste the URL of the this URL and then you need to add the token to authenticate the Jupyter Hub. If the way you do that is clicking on Hub Control Panel, the token. This is the token, you request a new token, this is the token to authenticate on the hub. So when you connect for the visual studio code, um, I'll just do it to show you. So there's an existing server that I'm going to connect to, and the server is um, this one. Let's, let's, there we go. It's this one with the user and all that stuff. So you just connect to those. But the end of it is... Ta -ta -ta -ta. It's only the documentation and then token equal and then I'm gonna copy the token I'm gonna call it test and then delete it so this is the token and then boom and how I'm gonna call it PC test because I'm gonna delete the token right after so you don't connect to my account <laughs> so now on the remote server and I can select the kernel of the remote center, PC test. Boom. Now I am, I am running locally the IDE, but the kernel is the remote one. I don't need to set up the subscription key because I'm using the PC hub remotely, but I'm using the PC hub. If I'm running this on, I don't know, GitHub Spaces or our server that I deploy, I would need to do a token of the PC, and the token of the PC, you get it here where is this data authentication api whoops using token for the access you go to developer portal there you go sign in and this is the token that authenticates not on the Jupyter hub the one that authenticates on the planet computer so you basically copy that and then just put it, that's the variable there. Since I'm gonna upload the output to Azure, I have this basically this um, code 
to put the token as a variable too, which is the SAS token variable. And then I define a couple of functions, which is upload data rate to blob, which is basically um, convert the data ray into a cog file, and then just upload it to the bucket PC Bruno San data. That's basically the one I do it. And I use the token to upload that. Upload that. This is another function, which is to download from a URL to data array. And this one, I don't think I use it, it's just to convert to blob URL, return, open, this is just to get that. So the difference, I guess this is a Rio X array and this is a Rasterio, that is the difference. So from to data array or to Rasterio. Okay, so none of this is starting to do the actual thing that I wanted to do. So this is how you do it. Um, I got the, I got the um, border of, just, you can get the floor anywhere, but I got the, um, I'm trying to see, where did I put this? It's just the border of Pakistan. There's no, there's no secret there. Where is the border of Pakistan? There you go. I put it here. So this is just the file you download from the ball bank that I put there, which is just the, the um, countries of the world. There you go, this one. This is the one I I wanted. So on the plan of the computer, on the, on the code, I get the data, load the JSON file, and just run this and load that GeoJSON and then I convert it to GeoPandas. I don't really know why, but I convert it to GeoPandas. I select the one that is Pakistan. If we wanted to do it somewhere else, I would somewhere else. And then this line is because I'm going to be basically asking the Planet computer to give me seams, to give me images that uh, overlap Pakistan. But to do that, if you send the entire geometry, it's kind of a complex geometry with a lot of vertices and that can choke the API. So I make the convex hull, which is a very simplified larger, which I don't really care. This is how I plot it. This whole thing is kind of by is just to uh, to make the nicer plot with land, coastlines, borders, oceans, lakes, rivers, all that stuff, which I don't need to do, but whatever. So then I plot the geometry of Pakistan in red. You see that in red and then I the whole of Pakistan in blue. So that's that's it. So you can see the whole is like a rubber band around the shape. It's gonna get more images, especially here, but it no, doesn't really matter. So I need, for the API, I need, um, that's the whole, I need the JSON file. So that's why I do all of these back and forth tricks, which is basically adding the geometry, basically you need that geojson geometry and I add a CRS and all that stuff. So at the end of the day, if I click the geom, it's gonna show me again the same thing as I was showing there. The times, I get an interval of, um, from August to September, this mm, taxonomy, uh, you can also see it in the planetary computer when you go to when you go to the code just whatever code there you go you can see an example here of the um, I that's not okay yeah obviously because I didn't select this is the um, taxonomy when you use interval thing but you can also go into the documentation but basically I have the pre flood in 2021 and the flood in 2022 from August to September. Why two months? Because I wanted to make the minimum of this time to kind of um, get rid of different extension if the flood moves or whatever. The resolution, I set it to the native resolution is 10 meter, right? 10 meter, I think it was. And that would be way too much resolution for what I want to do. So that's why. Am I, am I running this? There you go. Um, that's why I set up a resolution of 500 meters. The bigger the number here, the more time and the more resources it's gonna use. 
Now, this is the API of the, um, I connect to the API of the stack API of the planetary computer. And then some data sets like SAR, you need to authenticate to get that URL. And this the basically copy paste this code, which adds the token for each of the um, results. You can see that here, how many items are there. So, so. This is, the, this is the item collection of 569 items that uh, intersect the time and place. And for each of the items, you can see all the variables, but the one I want to show is that the, uh, no, the, the assets here, these are the assets that I'm interested. They have the tokens here, so this part is, sub, is added by this authentication modifier thing so that then you can get that data easily. Like for example, if I go to, oops, copy, if I start QEIS or any other tool, if I go without it, so this is the URL. If I go to that page, it's gonna, say hey this doesn't exist because it's not authenticated but if i add the SAS authentication like here layer add layer register and i put that url now it's gonna be oops this what does it say not support the rust that is response it should work. I don't know why it doesn't work. Let's try it again. And then your raster. This should work. Ah, oh, yeah. There you go. HTTPS. Boom. There you have it. It's pretty dark. So I'm gonna use the say the one. Let's put it here. Apply. There you go. This is the raw data and it's raster cog. So uh, it's zooming in and out. I don't need to download the whole thing. And it's, oops, it has zoom to layer. And if I add the OpenStreetMap, for example, it's properly located. This is the, this should be Pakistan. There you go. It's a very small part, or it's a tiny part of Pakistan. Okay, let's go back there. So this is the, these are the items, the item collection with the items. In the documentation of the planet computer, they usually, in the tutorials, they usually use the stack stack. If you go to the documentation and you go to, um, for example, this one, they are, they usually, well, of course, that's the one they don't. They usually use stack stack, which is the way you then stack the results of the stack endpoint <laughs> to create this pancake. The reason I'm not using stack stack is because there was some kind of bug that it would not read the overviews. So then it would try to make the native resolution, which is a ton a ton of computation and it would choke. And that's how, that's why I started a little issue with the, um, um, with this issue and they're looking at it. And hopefully when that fixes, then it's improved for everyone else. But because this is open source, I can also use whatever I want. And it turns out that open data cube has also stuck, um, to load the stacks and it's pretty much the same. So basically you, you can decide the chunks. So when you do computation, the chunks is basically the patches of images. You can define X, Y, so latitude and longitude, but also the chunk of time, like every 10 files. Um, like for example, if you do minimum or maximum, you can do any chunking that you want. If you do something like the medium or the percentile, you cannot chunk. So then you, you would do basically, I don't know, 
256 to 56 minus one to not chunk in that dimension. And then what's the other one? So you have X, Y, and T. Yeah, that's the other one. Because you only have one VV. Um, so that's the only band that I'm using. I think if you don't do any one, I think it uses um, 124 by 124. Let me see. Stack, stack, load. There you go. It's the chunk. Goodbye. Is this the one? Stack load. Chunk. Chunk. Two, 248, 248. That's the chunk, and that's fine. So, and then that's the resolution 500 meters, geometry, the geometry, and then whatever there are uh, numbers that are below zero, I put none to make sure that these are nuns and not other things. And then of that, it's only VV, but I, I basically select VV to, to have it already um, like that. So I run this. And it has created a 569 by 2029 um, so pixel size X and Y latitude and longitude um, by um, time, 3000 items of time. The um, chunks are, as I was saying, the um, chunks are 248, 248, and there are almost 3000 of those in one direction and 3,000 on the other direction, and then just one chunk of time. So there's in total 369 chunks. Um, you can also take a look to uh, the attributes of no data, a spatial reference, all that is done. I'm putting this here because there was a bunch of, um, a bunch of um, warnings. Oh, I forgot to deploy the dust cluster. And I talked a lot about the dust clusters, but then I didn't deploy one. So the way you deploy one is, there you go. This is the thing you need to do. In my code, this is kind of, all of this stuff is when you use a uh, dust cluster that is not the hub, but because I'm gonna use the one that comes normally, I just run this. So basically cluster gateway, I think I need to import, there you go, I need to import that's gateway so now it's gonna create a gateway cluster once the cluster is set up it's gonna get a client to that cluster and then it's gonna use adaptive clusters um, you can we can also use cluster.scale and put a number uh, let's probably let's do scale and it's just 10 i think it's gonna be enough use then or let's use it adaptive if so do you see how it deploys more and more if you want fixed you just scale it like that um let's do it like that and this is the url that you can go and see what up with the cluster so i have one two three four i think that was the minimum yeah minimum they are deployed. These they are there, and they these are the logs files, and they're waiting. Waiting for what? Waiting for an instruction. And which is the instruction I'm gonna give them? This is the compute when you send it to that that cluster, or when you do something that needs to do that. So what I'm going to do this is the this is the minimum value of the sign is the phone in case you're listening to it. I'm gonna take the minimum over time, skipping not available, of the whole time period of the flooding. Um, to remove some of the noises that I would see, I also add a rolling, the mean of a roll in two pixel X and Y. You can also remove that, but I like, I like to make it a little bit smooth. It's just two pixels on each side, so it's not really a problem. And then squeeze to so that at the end uh, the single the arrays whose dimension is only one 
item, then basically removes that dimension, which makes it easier to plot and things like that. And then that's the squeeze, and then compute to send the computation. And when you do that, you're gonna to start to see here that it sends, it's, come on, send the thing. Sometimes it takes, it's normally it doesn't really take time. So I want, ah, there you go. I don't know why it didn't work. So now it's doing all the computations. It's actually spin more. There are more of them. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. They are reading, they're churning through the VV1, um, doing the minimum, and processing all that stuff for the whole of Pakistan using the, using the overviews. As I was saying before, if I don't do 500 meters, if I take a resolution of 200 meters, I'm gonna have the same amount of results, but then when I send it computation, it's gonna be way more. You see how there's way more to process? So it's probably gonna start spinning up more. You see now it's spinning more nodes to do the computation. Blue is good. Yellow is that is is using I think it's the swap memories. Um and then red is something red here is this stopped or something not good with the workers, but you shouldn't worry about any of that because that's taken care automatically for you. Uh, let's leave it where it was where it was resolution and I'm just gonna wait for that. Or is it stopping? So I'm gonna stop it. And you see it stopped and it takes a little bit to stop and then I'll run it again with the new resolution. Oh yeah, no, it didn't work in resolution because it didn't run. And now it will run. Okay. And now it's where, where are you? There you go. Now it should be the fast one. There you go. This is the five meter resolution. Yeah, ten ones. Yeah, two thousand. I don't know where the attribute of the resolution is. Somewhere there. Who knows? Um, so Amazon. Then, I'm, if I plot this, what you would see is the plot is right here. Is that there's a lot more stuff there? It doesn't. It's not cropped to Pakistan. If I want to crop it to put it nicely, then I use real clip to the geometry of Pakistan. Do you see there right here? I'm just plotting it to show that it's doing something. And I'm gonna Rio, probably I need to import something that I forgot. Import Rio X array, I think is the one that has all that stuff. There you go, Rio X array. And what I do here is to write the coordinates because somehow they were not there. This is where my limited knowledge of Python, but I struggled with that until I realized I need to write the CRLs in place, so the dimensions, and now all these plot things work nicely. There you go. This is the minimum of the VV czar. Longitude, latitude, this is the, in the EPSG, the coordinate system of Pakistan, which is this one. The units are meters, and basically that's the one. That's why you don't see what you would expect otherwise of like Mercator or things like that. It's because they are, this is one is centered in this longitude. Because the EPSG, this one I think is basically a chunk of latitudes. EPSG, I think it's just, yeah, you see it's a chunk of uh, longitudes. 
or latitudes for a chunk of latitudes. Um, how were we? Yeah. So I did that already. I plotted this. I'm going to upload it to that. I didn't run that code. Okay, so let's set up some credentials. There you go. And now I can upload to. Same thing as I did before. If I go to Azure to the data to my container, put some data, which was the one PK float star mintif. PK floor star mintif. This one I can generate on the fly one token and if I go to QGIS, I can create a layer that is that processed. There you go. Close. So I guess there's a difference. Uh, but this is the this is the one I created. So this was the little image, and this is the bigger for the whole of Pakistan. But obviously, as you can imagine the one for pakistan is much smaller resolution than the one for the scene because this is native resolution but the thing that it's important for us is that this is where the flood happened you can see that uh, this this looks good it looks that the signal is there okay let's go back to it. this is where if you want to download it then you just download it now I show, this is where we I just plot an histogram of the values with 100 beans from 0 to 0 0.5 It's basically the same thing as if I go to here and I compute the histograms this is basically the same thing right so because of what I said in the beginning that the floods are in VV the lack of signal means it's mostly a specular reflection, and that means that there is no um, this is water. You can see there is one peak here, this is another peak here, another peak here. This one is land, basically. You can see that if I take the minimum here and the maximum here, and I apply it, and then I zoom out to see what am I saying. You will see basically this all this whitest thing. There are way I can do to, to render in you know, symbology, pseudo color. So it goes from blue actually label precision. Oh the minimum I didn't do that. So the if I what was the minimum that I said? Properties. Uh, if I go from minus 1, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, if I say here that I only want classes, I only want single That one. Oh, I, know. I wanted the silver color. Ah, here you go. Zero point one to zero point two. There you go. I don't guess. Can I do those numbers? Think of. I don't know what I can do. What draw? Sorry, I don't know why I cannot set that I want less classes, whatever reason. Okay, let's put it in gray. Contours, that's cool. Anyway. You could see here that oh wow, that's not. And one, 
to zero point two. All the shades are in all of these parts. That is the part that um, the, I look at the place that is not black. Sorry, like I don't know how to do how to only see some of the values of threads clip to mid marks. I guess if you use palleted and then one green for zero this for 0 0.1 and then 0 0.3 and then i think this is gonna work now no it doesn't oh because it's exact colors i am taking way too much time I'm taking way too much time for this. There you go. Just can I delete all the stops? Anyway, you get the idea of what I wanted to do. I am not gonna take much time to do that. So if I take that anything below zero point Zero six is water, and everything above zero point zero six is land. I get two. Mm, that is that is coming. There you go. This is the place that are below zero point zero six. This. Not only water, it's like deserts, like sand also creates the same really dark one. You can get that intuition if you go to the explore and then you go to like, I don't know, Saudi Arabia or things like that. It's, it's, that's why it's good to get an intuition of how sand looks like. It's just scrolling through. Do you see how desert looks like there's nothing there, just like water? So this is this is water and this is the sand. You can see how it just looks the same for physical reasons. And in the case of Pakistan, you can see that too. That um, Karachi, the city looks like this. Then land, there's like boats are very visible. But for example, this is probably sandy or marshes. And if you go, this is a lake. This is probably sand. You can go then to RGB to confirm, but that's basically the idea. So I do exactly the same thing I did before for the year before. So I do basically the same thing. Which I expect to receive the roughly the similar amount of um, items, 500. Yep, and I do the same thing, the minimum. This is just some errors of um, some tasks that didn't finish, and the one I was stopping the stuff, don't pay too much attention to that. You can go to task to see that this is charming through. You can also click all of these things to know what's going on, but basically it's just fancy ways, like this is the things it needs to do. So it's finishing here, the minimum and whatever this, all of these things are. This is the one I found the most useful. So once that finishes, there you go. You got the results. You clip to Pakistan, you upload it to Azure, and then you plot it. And you can plot also the histogram. You can see that so this is from the previous one. Let's just let me run it again. Comparing the histogram from 
is it one peak, another peak, and this peak here. So this one is similar height and then much higher for the land. You can see here that there's no peak here and this one is much higher. I think it's because this represents the places that are flat, like agricultural fields that are not as intense in meters as these ones. And when it's flooded, some of these guys go to this peak and some of these guys go to this peak and that's why you have that one. But I do not put the threshold here because in between there's also some places that are um, for example, flooded, but I suspect that if it's very muddy flood, it would be not as dark. I would be in this peak. And at the end of the day, what I want to do is the difference of the pixels that are below here, um, the year of the flood, then were not um, on the year before. So if they are low last year, it's because it's I don't know, a constant river or a lake or things like that. So this is the same thing I did before, and then so I'm plotting. So this is basically um, where the flood is less than the threshold. Otherwise, put a none. So basically, remove the thing, remove everything else, and then I plot it. The rows true is to put the maximum and the minimum to the 10 and 90 percentile, if I remember correctly. So I plot side by side because these are really large images, it takes a little bit of time. There you go. So you can see that this whole area is where the flood occurred. The, the desert here and the desert here appear the same. The, um, all of the, the river appears the same, the river appears the same. So to calculate the extent of the flood, what I want to do is subtract all of this from this. And that's exactly what I do. I say the flood, I start with the minimum, and I say that the flood is where the year of, um, it's, this is a bit complicated. So this is the year before, where the year before is not null, and the flood is, it's null, sorry. So it's null is where there was no, Null is all the white places. So the flood is the place where, let's put it like this. So the place where the year before was null, so the white places, that here is not, right? So that's how I calculated. You could do it in many ways, but I did it like this. And I then create another variable, which is a mask. So here it has the value 0 0.1, 0 0.02, 0. 0. whatever thing it is. But then to create the mask, I just say that put one if it's not zero, and then put zero if it's if it's zero. Leave it zero. So this is the mask. So uh, flood mask plot. So it basically only values one and only values zero. If I plot, I'll show you. If I plot here, not the flood mask, but the flood, I will get values. Bam. I will get the same image here, but a bit more muddy and more harder to read because basically I want to say, hey, is this one or zero? You see? So there's some places that are very, very dark and some places that are less dark. They're all less than 0 0.07, which is the flood extent but that's why I created the flood mask. Because then I'm gonna, to see the extent, oh yeah, one thing I do here is, I do a rolling to get rid of, you see there's a lot of little dots there. I don't wanna get rid of those because I don't think they represent flooding. So what I do is I make a rolling and I retain, the minimum of that rolling window, right? So if there's only one pixel, the minimum of the little window around it is gonna be zero. So that makes it disappear. I can put a bigger, a bigger roll window here, and that will basically remove more and more of those. And that's why on the second image, you will see the same thing as this, but without all of this speckling. I'm sure there are better ways to do this, but that's how I did it. So what is the extent of the flood? It's keeping the NAs 
how many, what is the sum? Because it's a, um, it's the, uh, it is a mask, zero one, F plot mask. So how many, what is the sum of how many pixels are there that are not zero? And multiply that for the resolution square, because the pixel is one meter square, uh, 500 meters square, uh, and then divide that to, from meters to square kilometers. That's 14,000 square kilometers. That's it. Now, if I want to create an RGB, because I want to take a look to that, I do the same thing. I need to change from Sentinel-1 radar to Sentinel-2 for the time the flood. This is super easy to do, you get the idea. I only have to change one um, word here and also to, to choose the ones that are not cloudy that uh, get me results that there's less clouds than 30%. This you can also get from the Explorer when you go to Sentinel 2, Advanced. There's a lot of filters that are advanced. You see cloud cover less than 50%, and then you see that 50% cloud cover there. You can also select any other filters, like, I don't know, granularity is whatever. I don't know what his IDs are, but the point is that then becomes this is the sixth syntax the cql2 um this is a much bigger stack because i'm gonna get the red the green the blue and the neon infrared to do ndbis but the rest is the same geom is the same c epsg is the same chunking i'm gonna leave it normally but there is way more there's two thousand items on uh, red green and blue and each of those have, instead of only one, they have four. So you can see here that I have the X, Y, red, green, blue, near infrared, right? So when I do the medium, I get the medium so that I remove clouds and things like that. This is a bigger computation, so it might take a little bit more time. There you go. Now it's start to do the thing. It starts with the blue for whatever reason. Then it's gonna do the red. It's probably gonna spin more workers because this is bigger computation. This is a bigger computation. There's 12,000 tasks, twelve thousand chunks of X Y. So probably if I go here, I don't know why I don't see the number of chunks, but you would see that that's the number of chunk in the chunks that it needs to process. Probably if I go to info and logs, it's probably requesting to get more. Requesting to scroll to 24 workers. So depending if it does available resources, it's gonna deploy more workers than that. You can also see the workers here. There's four workers. And they're all pretty. It takes a little bit of time to deploy them. These are the tasks that are working. How many workers I have for still? Now is in the green. I can also scale it up manually, like this is cluster scale twenty four. I'm not gonna do it now because it's in the middle of the computation and this is the largest one it has to do. And this is the it. Oh, when it finishes. You can even then also wait for cluster, wait, wait for workers 24 if you wanna wait for all of those. It's all on it. And the rest is the same. Clip it, clip it to Pakistan, upload it, RGB, print it. So true color, this is a little function to make the red, green, and blue, and make it a nice plot. 
and then I do the NDVI, which is near infrared minus red divided by near infrared plus red, and I plot it the same. Um, I could also upload that. I did not upload the NDVI plot. If I wanted to upload the NDVI, all I would need to do is NDVI plot, and I'll array, I'm gonna call it Pakistan and the VI plot, and this is the other one. So it's gonna upload that one. And then I do the same thing for the previous year. I'm just gonna put it all in the queue so that it's done. So same thing for the previous year. Do the median, upload it, upload the median. Um, Same thing, NDVI pre flood. I, let's upload it also to Azure. This one, yeah, this one is, there you go. And the variable name is NDVI pre flood. Flood, yeah, pre flood. And I'm gonna plot the RGB, is the true color the year and the year before basically this is to show that this is from the previous run obviously it's, it's still calculating all the stuff now it's getting up um you can see that there's some distinction but it's very subtle very subtle that's why the ndvi or sar it's much better and so in these things this is the ndvi there you go you see here all this flood in ndvi you can see it because it's negative water it tends to be negative and then you can see it right here that i'm gonna open it in the qgis when it uploads to so i can take a look and the the flood in ndvi how i define it is the places where the ndvi flood is less than zero because i said that the ndvi water tends to be less than zero but that is bigger, so basically that is is flood place than the year before. If it's the same, then it's a zero. If it's bigger, then retain the zero, right? So these are the places that are um, flooded that were not the previous year, and I get a similar one as before. I do the running trick um, with the to remove the the little dots struggle dots and that's what I get and I do the same thing and the area is much smaller and I think it's because one it's um, the median so if it was not flooded the entire period the median might be skewed but also I suspect very muddy waters might have an NDVI that is not less than zero. That's my hunch, but I don't really, I'm not really sure. And I can just plot the one with SAR and the one with NDVI. Maybe even you can also see which places are are detected in one and not in the other. But anyway, this, this is where the analysis can get um, more and more complex. How is the computation going? There we go. Now there is so many workers, it's so much faster to do this, doing everything. What is it doing? Go to, it's doing the, the year before already. It's doing the median of the year before. It probably takes like nothing. How much time did it take for, for this one? took five minutes to calculate that and for for the year of the flood and for this year I suspect it's gonna take one minute because it has all those workers. And that's it. As before you can go to Sur and then this is to the flood RGBI. There we go. Generate SAS. 
copy and then I am gonna add a layer and there's the raster layer. This is beautiful. A bit dark. Let's change those. The gram. Let's change the maximum to. Let's see what happens if I do that. Change. I guess we can put what red band. I guess there's other ways to do this better. Mm -hmm. Maximal cumulative, that's one to do it. Raster. Okay. Not the best, but this is the year of the flood, and this is with a five meter resolution. 500 meter resolution. Anyway, did it finish? Yeah, where are we? Doing that's done. Yeah, it's doing the flood on the NDBI. There you go. Now it's doing the rolling to remove the speckling. And I guess I should already have on Azure the new one, which is the float VI not yet. I guess maybe I need to reload. There you go. Modified. And this is what I was doing the quantiles. NDVI flood and NDVI pre flood. These two ones. I wanted this. this. Copy. And then I don't want this as one of the things. Right, and then you know, my brain choked for a second. Add layer, a raster, what you call there you go, add and this is a little interesting because I wanted hmm I wanted one that is I need three colors to show them. Mm -hmm. Color ramp. I wanted three. I don't know how to do this. If people know how to do that stuff, you can do it. But I'm gonna stop it here. So what's the zero? 